Behind me, you can see an ancient seawall that turned a tiny Israelite village into a mighty Roman port. Caesarea Maritima, or Caesarea by the Sea, was the center for military and government operations for Romans' rule over Israel and most of the Middle East. We will walk where Peter and Cornelius, Paul and Philip once walked, and see the waters where the first Gentiles were baptized into Christ. We can even see proof of Pontius Pilate. Walk with me today, and as we go, let's see how this place can increase our own walk of faith. Caesarea is situated about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Until the time of the Roman emperors, Israel had no port suitable for major shipping operations. The Israelite coast remained difficult to access until the time of Caesar Augustus and his local ruler Herod the Great. Although a tyrant and a murderer, Herod the Great was also a master builder. Herod the Great is one of the most recognizable figures in biblical history, in part because he was such a villain. You know, we know him as the ruler who tried to murder Jesus, but he was a skilled politician and he is remembered as the greatest builder in the history of Israel. His projects were some of the most spectacular in the ancient world, and that includes the city of Caesarea. Herod built this incredible city primarily because he needed a port on the Mediterranean and Israel just didn't have any natural harbors. But he also wanted to curry favor with Rome and demonstrate his own greatness. He was successful. With the full support of Caesar Augustus, Herod took an unknown part of coastline in the middle of Israel and built a major city with a tremendous seaport and all the facilities of a major Roman city. The construction lasted only about 12 years, finishing in about 10 BC. Herod named the city Caesarea in honor of Caesar Augustus. In the year AD 6, Caesarea became the seat of Rome's provincial government in Palestine and the main gateway from Rome to the Middle East. There's a very old truth, and that is that flattery will get you everywhere. After Herod built this amazing city, he named it after and dedicated it to Augustus Caesar. Now, Herod knew that he needed to maintain good relationships with Rome in order to continue as the client king of Judea. This was his way of demonstrating his loyalty to the Roman emperor, and of all the cities of Herod's kingdom, Caesarea was one of the crown jewels. The most remarkable piece of the city's construction was an enormous breakwater, or seawall. At the time of its construction, the seawall created the largest artificial harbor in the world. The wall also created the largest port in all of the Middle East. The seawall extended over 500 yards into the sea on the south and over 275 yards on the north. The walls reached a depth of more than 120 feet. This allowed the largest of ships to enter the port. The seawall was a masterpiece of engineering and technology. To build the seawall, the Romans pioneered hydraulic concrete technologies in amazing ways. The width of the wall was as much as 200 feet, with elaborate buildings and houses built on top of the wall, making it part of the amazing city. Ships pulled through a gate in the breakwater and unloaded directly onto the seawall which provided a solid surface for transporting cargo to land and beyond. The city had a large forum full of commerce, Roman baths with amazing tile mosaics, 
houses, and all the characteristics that Roman cities had. With its large protected port, the city became the gateway to the Middle East, sometimes being called the Eastern capital of the empire. Well, you know the first century historian Josephus wrote that Herod built that harbor in order to display, quote, the innate greatness of his character. And because in thrusting the massive breakwaters far out into the sea, the king displayed, he said, an ambition to conquer nature herself. But it wasn't just the harbor that Herod built. It, a city this large with all of the urban areas and the bathhouses and the fountains and the ritual baths and the temples and, and the public buildings, they all had to have a large supply of fresh water. So what he did was he built this massive Roman-style aqueduct, and he channeled water from the springs that were on the southern slope of a mountain some eight miles away. Parts of that aqueduct, along with the adjacent one that was built by Hadrian 100 years later, can still be seen today. All of that water, it was essential for the people that were traveling through there and living there, but it was also essential for Herod's personal residence and for the buildings that he constructed for the arts and for entertainment, many of which were large and lavish. Wow, this really was a city of luxury. Near the seawall and port, the city boasted a theater that held as many as 4,500 people. In recent years, the theater has been partially restored and is used for concerts and other performances even today. On the southern side of the seawall, Herod built an enormous palace for himself. The palace is called the Promontory Palace because it actually extends into the sea. The palace was an opulent testimony to Herod's wealth, power, and architectural accomplishments. Remarkably, the house contained stone swimming pools more than 120 feet long and 45 feet wide, almost at sea level. Although almost completely Roman, the palace even had a mikveh, a Jewish bath for ritual cleansing. After Herod's death, this palace became the headquarters and official residence of whatever governor or procurator Rome installed to oversee Judea. In fact, as recorded in Acts chapter 12, this is most likely the place where Herod Agrippa I was eaten by worms after accepting worship from the people of Tyre and Sidon. There are several episodes recorded in the New Testament that take place at or connect to Caesarea Maritima. We know of the Pilot Stone. We know that Roman prefects like Pontius Pilate were stationed there. We know that Cornelius and associates were converted there. So this city with its large harbor, it played a role in Paul's missionary journeys. And it was in Caesarea that Paul was held for just over two years by the procurators Felix and Festus. From there, he sailed to Rome for trial. The details of all of these biblical descriptions align exactly with what is known about this ancient city as confirmed by outside sources and archaeological investigations. So these are valuable confirmation that what we are told in the Bible is accurate and reliable. When Paul was arrested and transferred to Caesarea, Paul was kept in Herod's praetorium, or official residence. Completing the complex with the palace and theater was a hippodrome for chariot races and other large spectacles involving men and animals. The hippodrome, the theater, and the palace were sites for major cultural and sporting events. And the hippodrome, or as Josephus described it, the amphitheater, was it was about 300 meters long. It was 50.5 meters in width. Its stones that were used in its construction were cut from the fossilized sandstone in the area, and the stadium itself could hold about 10,000 spectators. In the center of that hippodrome, there was a series of sub-chambers and tunnels that were discovered. And then on the east side of the seating area, archaeologists discovered the remains of a, of a podium where a lot of the dignitaries evidently sat. At its completion, there was this special series of games that were conducted, and they, they did that in honor of Caesar. And all of those games included things like chariot races and gladiatorial fights with wild animals. It was quite a spectacle. The design and the opulence of that particular hippodrome and all of the other complexes surrounding it, they were so remarkable. But 
To me, what is even more exciting is the connection between these places and the events that are revealed in Scripture. One such connection involves the name of a Roman official whom Scripture says had sentenced Jesus to death. In 1961, a partially damaged stone was found that contained an immensely important historical record. That stone is now housed in a Jerusalem museum, but here at the site is an exact replica near where the stone was found. The stone has been dated to AD 26 to 37. The stone was discovered in a secondary context. It had been reused as building material for another structure, but originally it was part of a building constructed in the honor of the Roman emperor Tiberius. This is significant because at one time, critics would have claimed that Pilate was a fictional character invented by the gospel writers. The inscription gives us solid archeological evidence of Pilate's existence, and it fits perfectly with all of the relevant information we find in both scripture and in Roman history. Translated into English, and correcting for the damaged parts of the stone, the inscription reads as follows. To the divine Augusti Tiberium, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated this. This stone inscription, dedicating a building to Tiberius Caesar, verifies not only Pontius Pilate's name and location, it also verifies his position. Until this stone was found in 1961, no Roman inscription even recorded the existence of Pontius Pilate. Today, because of this stone, no reasonable doubt exists as to the accuracy of the biblical record that Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea when Jesus was crucified. The excavations of Caesarea Maritima over the years have provided an amazing amount of detail that seamlessly and in, in, in every way coincide with Luke's account written in Acts. In the first century AD, Caesarea exhibited more Roman influence than any other city in Israel. The city was full of Roman paganism and debauchery. The majority of its inhabitants were non-Jewish, with a huge number of government and military officials. The city soon became the largest city in Judea, with as many as 120,000 residents. Because Caesarea was the center of Roman government for Israel, it naturally became a military center with thousands of Roman soldiers and military officers. One such centurion is described in Acts chapter 10, named Cornelius. Cornelius was assigned to the Italian regiment. Apparently, he lived in a well-appointed house with a large number of family and servants here in Caesarea. Such an officer's house would have been located in the more affluent section of the city, near the Forum, Theater, and Hippodrome. Here, Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius and his household. Upon hearing the good news of forgiveness being offered in Christ, Cornelius and his household were baptized in water right here in Caesarea, the first Gentile converts. In the city that thrived because of its access to water, Peter said, no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, Acts 10, 47. Well, what happened at Caesarea with the centurion's obedience to the gospel really was a, a monumental event in the history of Christianity. It was the conversion of a Gentile to what many thought was merely an aberrant Jewish movement. So when Cornelius is baptized, it stands as a seminal moment in the history of Gentile conversions to Christianity. Caesarea stands as powerful proof of the historical accuracy of the Bible. Not only does it confirm exact details of Rome's involvement in the murder of Jesus, but it also provides valuable insight into the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year administration of Roman rule over Israel. Caesarea testifies to the power of God's promises. The rulers in Caesarea murdered James, imprisoned Paul, and cast followers of Jesus into contests with wild animals. 
But the work of the imprisoned has triumphed over the tyrants. Just as Herod the Great, Pontius Pilate, and Herod Agrippa exercised authority for a very short time, the entire Roman Empire has paled with passing history, which can be seen in Caesarea. By contrast, though his followers were imprisoned and killed, the kingdom of Christ marches on. Caesarea's ruins are now proof that God uses the forces of the world to accomplish spiritual change. The Romans built Caesarea to facilitate their rule. The Lord co-opted Caesarea's sea access to spread the gospel all over the world. God invaded Rome's most important military center with one man teaching a centurion and his family. God used the water of the first century's most amazing port to bring the first Gentiles into the kingdom of heaven. He also used the concentration of political leaders to take his gospel to the highest echelons of earthly government. Worldly leaders, they can persecute, they can imprison, and they can even kill, but God's word marches right through their violence to accomplish his will, even using their own tools like seaports and prisons. Regardless of what man intends or builds, God will accomplish his will. No matter the size of the forces against us today, or the personal sacrifices God calls on us to make, our God provides the victory in Jesus in a city that will never fade away with time. You are the canyon and I am a crevice. You are the heavens and I am a star. You are the thunder and I am a wind. When you first see Caesarea, it's overwhelming to grasp the magnitude of Roman power, their economic power, their technology and ability to build, their military might, their governing power, the ability to control lands far and wide. And then you add to that the magnitude of Herod the Great's building efforts and his power compared to his tyranny and his mass murder of children and murder of others. And then you realize that God took these mighty Roman buildings and these mighty Roman things and turned them into a highway for the gospel. And so these Roman ruins lie in complete destruction, but the gospel goes on and on. Ancient historians said that Herod built a harbor in order to display the innate greatness of his character. And because in thrusting the massive breakwaters far out into the sea, he showed that he could conquer nature herself. Well, ultimately, quote, nature, or should we rather say God, had the last word because by 500 AD, the harbor had fallen out of use altogether. 2,000 years later, however, archeologists are determining not just how large and sophisticated the harbor was, but also the entire city of Caesarea. This crown jewel of a city belonging to King Herod the Great boasted a, a huge temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus. It had a large aqueduct. It, it had beautiful bathhouses and fountains, a theater, an amphitheater, which later was converted into a hippodrome. And then it had a luxurious palace with a freshwater swimming pool that was perched right on the edge of the beautiful Mediterranean. It was a technologically advanced and very impressive city. But what is even more memorable and more impressive are the stories of the Christian men and women who in Caesarea so proudly served Jesus in the face of so much decadence and paganism. At Caesarea, a Roman centurion was baptized into Christ. The daughters of Agabus prophesied, and the Apostle Paul, even though he was in prison, preached the gospel to three powerful magistrates. Caesarea was also the place from which many Christians launched their missionary efforts to other places in the world. So while Caesarea was designed to be a Roman city, in fact, Rome's capital in Israel, God used it as a launching pad for making known the good news about Jesus. And interestingly enough, the once proud and powerful city of Herod the Great and the Roman Empire now lies in ruins. But the message and ministry of Jesus continues to live on.